glad that you're here this morning. I want to invite you this morning to take your Bible, and I want you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, a little toward the end of the New Testament, but I want you to turn there with me, and we're going to be looking at some verses, same verses over the next couple weeks, and I want to, I want to talk to you on this subject, uh, the church in crisis. Sean, can you put that title up there, or is it up there? It's up there. All right, just pretend I'm seeing it up there, okay? The church in crisis. And here's what I I want us to try to do. I want us to try to answer how should the church act in the current culture we live in? Now, we might call it COVID culture if you want to. I I don't, that's just where we're at right now. We, we, by crisis, we could, I guess, call it this, this anarchy or this rebellion that we're seeing. But gang, history has shown us that at different times. But nonetheless, we're in this culture. And I think there's a question that has to be answered. How are we going to handle that? How, how should the church handle things like that? How, how should you as a Christian, how should I as a Christian feel, act, talk, in this particular moment in history. Well, when Paul wrote this letter to the church at Thessaloniki, we call it now Thessalonians, I guess, the letter of Thessalonians, he wrote to a church that was under pressure. In fact, most of the New Testament letters are written to churches in pressure, right? Paul had started the church, and he stated just a little while he was forced to leave, And so when he left, he sent Timothy back to get a check on how they were doing. Timothy came back and said, hey, they're they're really doing good. But Paul, they're in pressure. They're in a tough culture. Uh, Persecution is there. It's rising. They're, uh, They're under duress. And so Paul writes a letter to them. First of all, he's commending them for who they are and how they're holding up. But he, he's trying to encourage them. And, and when you read the letter, he, he basically does it in two ways. First, he sets squarely in front of them that God has not forgotten them, that God is in control of everything that's facing them. And dear church, I, I want you to know that while we're feeling some of this anti-God uh, feel against us, What I want you to know is that God has not forgotten you. And God has not forgotten us. And God is the God that takes care of his people. And he wanted, Paul wanted them to know that. But I think under the inspiration of scripture, Paul wants us to know that as well. But there's a second thing, especially in chapter one that we're going to be dealing with over the next couple of weeks, that that they are a marked people. And what I, what I mean by that is that Paul wants them to know that they're chosen of God. His face is toward them. His hand is upon them. Even while they're in the pressure cooker, they are still and always will be the people of God because they were chosen by God before the foundation of the world. Now, gang, I want you to grab hold of that. Some of the things I'm going to share with you may challenge your theology a little bit this morning. It doesn't challenge mine, but it might challenge yours. And that's okay. That's okay. But after you hear the message and after we wade through some of the um, thoughts, the text, what I want you to walk away with is this, that you are the people of God and that God has marked you out. God has chosen you in Him. And because of that, you're okay. Because of that, I'm okay. And because of that, we who are the people of God are okay. Now, I know you're in chapter 1, but I want you to turn first to chapter 5. And let me read you just a couple verses. I think we're going to put it on the screen. Chapter 5, beginning verse 23, says, Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. It, It means to set you aside for a purpose. Now, here's a church that's under 
duress. Here's a church that's under incredible pressure. And he says, may the God of peace. We need peace today, do we not? I, I need peace. You need peace. May he sanctify you entirely. Now notice he says, may your spirit and your soul and your body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice in verse 24, he says, Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Uh, As I studied the passage, and as I tried to read about what it was like back then, as I tried to dig all that out to share things with you, let me tell you what I wrote down, and I'm not positive I'm right on this particular point. The rest of it I will be, okay? But I'm not positive I'm right. But I, I, what, I, what I want you to kind of grab hold of is that what they were facing, what, what they were going through, and the persecution and the fire that they were going through was, I wrote down far worse. I don't know that that's accurate. I will say it's worse than what you and I are going through. And the people of God have always gone through fires. The people of God have always suffered. The people of God have have always uh, had moments of persecution. And I think what they were going through is worse than what we're going through today. Now, I understand it's in front of us. And I understand we have to deal with it. I I know that. There's a challenge on how we do it, of course. But he's writing to people who are struggling, I believe, in the pressure cooker worse than us. And so the question is, how do we act? How do we react to what's happening? Okay? And he wants them to get a handle on who they are. Because there are people, when you understand who you are, who's, let me take that back. When you understand whose you are, then you're going to know what to do. If you don't know who you are in Christ, if you don't know what God has done for you, if you, don't under, if you don't understand that God, according to His sovereign grace, that He has called you, that He has brought you into His family, if you don't know who you are, then how in the world are you going to hold up under all the pressure? That's what Paul's trying to get across to them. Here's who you are, dear people. And because of that, here's how you can make it. And that's kind of my, my, my theme. Let me throw the two-week outline up before you there, okay? Who are we? Come on, guys. Okay, who are we? Well, the first thing that Paul talks about in verses 1 through 4, reaction 1 through 5 that we're going to deal with today, is that we are an elect people. That's going to scare some of you. And some of you are going to think, "Uh uh-oh, but we're going to deal with it. Because at the end of it, I think you're going to come away thinking, golly, I belong to God. And so today we're going to talk about that we're an elect people, okay? Next week, we're going to look at verses 6 and 7. We're going to see that we're an exemplary people, that we're to be an example. And I don't want to get ahead of next week. But let me caution you. Be careful how you act. Be careful how you talk. We are the people of God. Act like the people of God. We're to share the love of Christ. We're to live the love of Christ before a lost world. Everything else that's going on and all they're doing, they're not the people of God. We are the people of God. And we're going to talk about that word example, what that really means. And I'm going to challenge you a little bit next week. Number three, verse nine is going to tell us that we're an enthusiastic people. Man, there ought to be something exciting about being a follower of Christ in the midst of the pressure, in the midst of the problems. There ought to be something exciting about being the people of God who have been marked out by God before eternity ever began. That in the counsel of God, He called us and He set us aside. We belong to Him. And if we belong to Him, we can handle anything that comes. And then next week, Verse 10, we're going to see that we are an expectant people. One of these days, maybe soon, 
Come, Lord Jesus. He's coming back. And he's going to deliver. The word is rescue his people. And so the next two weeks, that's going to be our outline. I want you to stand with me in honor of God's word. And I want us to read together First uh, Thessalonians chapter 1. And then we'll try to take it apart, okay? You there? All right. Paul and Silvanius and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind. Now here's where it's going to get interesting for us. Constantly bearing in mind your works of faith. Number two, your labor of love. And number three, and steadfastness steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, His choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, That is Jesus who delivers us or rescues us from the wrath to come. Let's pray for just a moment, okay? Father, I I pray that you'll help me convey the joy of my study. Um, God, we get called a lot of things. We get a lot of stones thrown at us. Being the people of God, we're not well liked in some circles. But we've never been liked. The Christian community has never been liked uh, in certain circles. But God, we've got to focus on who we are. We've got to define who we are. We have to realize the beauty of it, what it really means. And that way we can handle the stones that come. And so God, this morning as we look at the first part of our outline, that you'll guide my thoughts and my heart that, God, I can um, clearly, as clearly as I as a human can, share the beauty of election, that we shouldn't be scared of it. There's a reason for it, and it's beautiful. And uh, I think, Lord, uh, while some will wrestle with that term, I think the, uh, the bottom line is we're just glad that, that we belong to you because of your choice, not our choice. And that's comforting in times of pressure. Guide our thoughts, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks. Be seated, okay? Look at verses 1, kind of 1 through 5. We'll kind of begin to unpack that. We'll also go to verses 9 and 10 this morning, okay? Now, let me just say up front, you heard my prayer maybe, that the word elect or chosen has caused people a lot of spiritual heartburn, <laughs> and, but it need not. In fact, beloved, it's a blessed thing to know that a person selected and a person is saved by God outside the efforts of man. Now, you think about that with me for just a moment. If good works can save you, then how much does it take for you to save? Think about that. If I don't believe in the election of God, if I don't believe God saves me according to the kind intentions of His will, and it comes back to to me doing something to be saved or to merit or be worthy of it, then the question I've got to answer is, how much is that? Tom, if you can get there on your own effort, how much effort is it going to take for you to be acceptable to God? The second thing is, if works condemn, then how much, 
How bad does the work have to be to be condemned away from God's present? And so Paul's going to deal with that in the passage. Not only that, I think that God's people were told by Paul that God's people are not a club. We're not a social organization. Should we be social? Yeah, I think we probably should be good good companions, good uh, citizens. Uh, we ought to vote. Get off your duffs, register and vote. Vote, vote Bible. If you're not going to vote Bible, don't go vote. Okay? I think we ought to be all of that, okay? But, but gang, listen to me. We who belong to Christ, we who are the bride of Christ, we who are the church of Jesus Christ, we're a spiritual entity. And so we operate according to spiritual laws. And we look through the, the lens of spirituality, not worldly humanism. And, and Paul's wanting them to know that. Now, now, the word elect, as I said, or the word predestination, creates tension with people. And, and I'm not sure why. Unless maybe just by the definition, there's be sh- maybe some confusion there, okay? It's built around the fact that people, God does what He pleases. And we should want it to be that way. Don't don't you want a God that does as He pleases? Don't you want a God that when you get up in the morning and have to live through the day, and then especially when you go to bed at night, don't you want to know that you have a God that is in in control of all things? Sure you do. You want a God who who is in control of all the natural laws because when you jump up, you want to come back down, right? Well, why would we not want that? Or why would we have tension in our heart when it comes to the the area of our, our spiritual nature and especially with regard to salvation? You see, I said it a moment ago, it's comforting to me to know that God does not look at me and my good areas and say, Tom is worth saving. How can that be? Because there's nothing in me that makes me worthy to be saved. Gang, I hate to tell you this, but you're not very good. Matt preached on it a few weeks ago. The depravity of man. You may think you're good, and your mother may tell you good, but your mother's wrong. (laughs) You're not very good. And there's nothing, if God were to look at Tom and say, okay, uh, what is there in Tom that's worth saving? You know what God would say? Nothing. Because there's nothing there worth saving. On the same other side of the coin, God would look at my bad areas and say, well, really, not only is Tom not worth saving, but Tom's really bad, and there's a lot of evidence to that, isn't there in the Bible, in our nature, in how we act? I was talking to someone several years ago, and we got on the subject of election. And I have to tell you, gang, uh, it, this has been a journey for me. I, have, I, I had to come to grips with it. I finally came to grips with it while I was in seminary studying the original language. That's, and it's just glaring to me. This is it. This is why we have weak Christians, because they're, they're scared of it. They, 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 they don't understand something, and so they reject it. But I finally came to terms with it, and I was talking to someone several years ago, and we got on the subject of election. And the person said to me, I don't believe in that junk. And I said, well, um, you've got to believe in it. No, I don't. I said, yeah, you really do. Wayne, it's used over 50 times in the New Testament. You've got to believe it. It's a Bible doctrine. I said, now, how you want to define it? How you want to flesh it out? Hey, that's up to you. But you have to believe in election because over 50 times in the New Testament, the Bible talks about it. And then I made a statement, right or wrong, I don't, you know, good or bad, it's when he didn't slap me, and he's bigger than me, everybody's bigger than me. I, uh, I said, well, let me just tell you, if you tell me that you don't believe in election, then my response to you is, you don't believe the Bible. And he looked at me, and he said, what do you mean? 
I said, well, dude, it's used over 50 times in the New Testament. There has to be something to it. And then I said, don't you want a God that is sovereign? Don't you want a God that is in control? You know what helps me through this? This has been a tough year for all of us. You, you agree with that? Let me tell you, it's been harder on pastors than it, perhaps in, in my 35 years in ministry, you know? And I, 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 I tell you, because of this past year that we, uh, the year we're living in, get it over with, God. And because of all of this, I am glad to know, my dear people, that Tom's not in control of all of this. That God is in control of all of this. And so I said to him, aren't you, doesn't it bring comfort to you that while you may not understand everything of God and you may not be able to write it down and define it and come to terms and there may be a little, you might need to take some spiritual tums in there from time to time. Aren't you glad to know that there's a God that's in control of everything? Dale, there's a God that's in control of life and death. And you've experienced a whammy this year. God is still in control, Dale. You've got to understand that. You've got to believe that. How else, how else would you handle some of your challenges? How would we handle some of our challenges if we not, did not believe that God was in control? Now listen, I understand there's a lot of points of confusion. But it gives comfort, does it not, to know that in every circumstance, no matter how challenging, that God is in control... That God always does as He pleases. And whatever He pleases is always holy in love and righteousness. It, it does me. Now, let me define for you Tom's definition of this elective process. And maybe that will help you a little bit, okay? God in sovereign grace chooses. Man in humble faith responds to the gift of faith and repentance. Bam. Bam. Man is then converted. You see, election must be God's free choice. We love Him because He first what? Hello, Jesus. We choose Him because He first chose us. You see, where I think we've lost it in our churches over the last 30, 40 years is we come back to this salvation being a decision. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says salvation is a response. The Bible indicates to us salvation is receiving. You must be born again, Nicodemus, you see. And so, so what we have to believe is that God's free to do whatever He wants. And whatever He, does, whatever he pleases and whatever he, he pleases to do, I'm comfortable with that because I believe in Him. Now, let's go back to the Old Testament a moment. And let me give you an illustration. I think everybody in this room and in our next service would agree that Israel was God's chosen people marked out from the beginning. Do you believe that? You've got to believe that, Right? God came to Abraham in a pagan nation, living among pagan people whose forefathers were pagan forefathers. And what did he say to Abraham? Get up, get out. Go to a land that I'm going to tell you. What did he do? He got up and get out. <laughs> he went to a land that God had chosen. Because he had to get away from the paganism. That's a sovereign act. of I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to be a great people. You're going to be my people. All of us agree that the nation of Israel is the people of God, okay? The Old Testament is a record of God dealing with his chosen people. Now, we're going to put up Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7, 6, and 8. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people of His own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Now, now why? Look at the next verse. The Lord did not set His love on you or choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you 
and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand, redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Why did God choose the nation of Israel? Because they were mighty? Or they were strong? Or they were good? No, no. He chose them because he decided for them to be the people of God. Let me give you a, a, a New Testament verse, 1 Peter chapter 2. But you, now he's speaking to the church here. He's, so he's speaking, if you're a believer in Christ, he's not, not if you're on the roll of Indian Springs, but if you're a believer in Christ. You with me on that? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Why? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why did God choose the nation of Israel? He just chose them. He set his love on them. Why did he choose us? Because he just loved us. That we might proclaim to him his marvelous light. 2 Timothy 2.19, Paul said this, The Lord knows those who are his. So, beloved, I, I, I submit to you that election is a beautiful thing. I mean, we're about to elect the president. God help us. We're about to elect the president. We choose a president. The same way God chooses his people. It is right for him to do that because he who creates has authority over who or what he creates, you see. Now, it, it does bring up a, a, a practical question, okay? How does a person, how does he or she know that they're chosen by God. I, I, I tell you, if we have to deal with a tough subject called election that has caused a lot of heartburn for people, then I think the next question that comes, well, how do you know? How, if, if you're asking yourself, well, okay, Tom, there's something to this election. I, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge to me. But how do I know if I'm the elect? How do I know if I have been Chosen by God. Well, I'm glad you asked. Because if you begin looking in verse 3 with me, Paul gives us three marks of the elect. Verse 3, work of faith. Now, I want you to take that phrase in verse 3, work of faith. And then I want you to look at verse 9, because he explains it a little bit in verse 9. A work of faith, verse 9, because you have turned to God from idols. You see, when God sets His love on a person, He gives the gift of faith. And faith is the awareness and then the surrender that God is who He says He is. He is worth believing and He is worth following. And the only way to have saving faith, dear people, is to turn from sin. To turn from idols, idols of the heart, and to trust in the true and living God. How do, you, how do you know that you're the elect? Because there's a can work, initial work and a continual work of faith going on in your life. Is there a work of faith going on in your life? Have you turned from idols to God to serve the living and true God? Are you trusting in God alone for your eternity? Or are you still trying to merit your way in some kind of religious work or some kind of merit or some kind of effort? How do you know if you're elect? Well, Paul in verse 3 tells us, first of all, there's a work of faith going on in your life. There's a change that, that happened and is happening continually in your life. And you've got to shake that out. And you've got to answer that. Because there's so many people today that so easily make some kind of quick profession of faith. And they go right back to the hell holes in which they live. They're not saved. Those who know the Lord Jesus are continually seeing the work of faith in their life the continual work of faith in their life. That's what the Bible says, you see. Number two, go back to verse 3 and then verse 9. The labor of love. Connected to verse 9, to serve a living and true God. So not only is there a work of faith where you're turning to God, but there's the labor of love where you're serving the living and true God. Let me show you something interesting. In verse 3, the word work that is used to speak about faith is a word which means to act 
or to surrender. But the word labor in, in verse 3 is the word kopos. And it's a word which means intense toil. It's from a word which means to cut down or chop down. Sometimes in the gospel, it's translated trouble, okay? And then that word serve in verse 9 means to become a slave, doulos, become a bond slave, okay? Now, here's, here's what Paul is letting them know, and, and I, I hope Paul is letting you know, okay? These dear saints know, and they have to know, that love is hard. Love toils. Love sacrifices. Love serves. And the love that you show to God can almost become unbearable. It becomes almost where it breaks you. And that's what was happening to them. And the love of God almost does that to us. How many of you have been married over six months? Huh? That's what I'm talking about. I, when I have premarital counseling, I always go through the stages of marriage, and I always tell them the first stage is romantic stage. That's when everything's perfect, and it lasts about three months. Then you hit the realistic stage, and what happens? It becomes hard. It's a work. It's a labor. It's a kopos. It's trouble. It's the cutting, the breaking of love. And that's one of the uh, uh, confirmations that, that we know God, that even if the pressure is hard and even if the furnace is hot, we, we love Him. There's that work of love, that toil of love. And we just keep serving Him, no matter how difficult it is. They needed to know, we need to know, that love requires our best. And that's one of the marks of being the elect. There's a work of faith where you're continually turning away from that which is bad to that which is good. But there is that labor of love that you're going to love Him no matter what it's like, no matter how hard it is, no matter how hot the furnace. I'm going to continue to be a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you can know. One of the marks you can know you belong to Him. And then number three, verse three, the steadfastness of hope. Connect that to verse 10 now, to wait for His Son from heaven. Here's the picture that Paul is painting. We endure. We hold up under pressure, whatever that pressure may be. We patiently trust because we know that Jesus is coming from heaven. We know that our Savior lives. We know that He'll rescue us or deliver us from the wrath that's coming. You see, for the believer, hope is not wishful thinking But it's confidence. It's an expectation of confidence knowing that tomorrow is going to be better than yesterday. And one day it's going to be really good because he's going to come and get us. And so first what Paul is telling the church is you're part of God's people. You're you're the elect. How do you know that you're the elect? How can you spot a real believer in our current commotion? Because they're Republican? (laughs) Because they have stands of moral conviction? Hmm? Because they're a church member? Hmm? No. They have a work of faith going on where they keep turning from idols to God. They keep loving no matter how hard and hot it is. And they persevere living for Jesus because they know that He's coming to rescue. Now, gang, you've heard me say, and I say to you again, we don't know who is saved and who is not saved. God knows that. And I am no man's judge. But here's what I want you to get this morning before we move on. Paul very clearly talks about God's election, the choice of God. And even though you may get in some tension with that in your spirit, you can go to verse 3 and you can go to verse 9 and 10 and you can say, here are the marks of a believer. And you can look at other people and you can talk to other people. When you're sharing the blessed gospel of Jesus Christ, you can go to this chapter and you can say to them, is there a work of faith going on in your life where you turn from idols to serve the living and true God? Is there this labor, this this love that continues in the face of a hot, fiery furnace? Is that going on in your life? Is there this confidence that you know no matter how bad it gets, 
The best is yet because Jesus is coming to rescue us. And therefore, because of that, I'm going to persevere. I'm going to stand up under the pressure. I believe Jesus is worthy. I believe Jesus will take care of all things. And I trust Him. And if you can look at your life and say, answer these, then I would say, yeah, you're the elect. Welcome to the elect world of God. You see. Oh, but if you're not, or if your friends are not, or if your families are not, then you have cause for concern. Let me, let me close this way. Let the theologians debate. Let's spend our time living for Christ. Now, there's one final question I want to answer. Why did Paul write this? Why did Paul write verse 4, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice? Did Paul write that for confusion? Did you think he wrote that to confuse them? Say, I'm going to really throw a monkey wrench in their thinking. You think he did that? Or do you think perhaps Paul said, you know, I'm going to throw that verse in there because all of this church age now that we're in, there'll be great debates and arguments. And theologians are going to write letters and they're going to get on both sides of the coin and they're going to battle it out and, and, and wrestle it out. And it's going to be so much fun. I'm going to be in heaven listening to all that. You think that's what Paul didn't know? Why did he throw verse 4 in there? Because these dear people were in a hellhole. These dear people were in the furnace of affliction. It was terrible for them, worse than it is for us today. But he wanted them to know, and I want you to know, that if you're in Christ, if these things are working in your life, you are the people of God. And you live as the people of God. And the people of God will live that way. That's what it means to be elect. Oh, people, listen to me. If you have been saved by the kind intention of the will of God, then you're His people chosen in eternity past. You have been selected by God. You can handle anything that you will handle anything that comes. Because there's this continual work of faith. There is this continual trouble, (laughs) sacrifice of love. And there is this continual steadfastness of hope until he comes for the rescue. I read this week where where, uh, a man was hiking or something, I forget exactly, but a tree fell and on him, and he was there for four days. But he knew that someone would eventually come, and he kept waiting. Four days in the woods, someone came and rescued. Can I say to you, you keep, you keep work in faith. You keep sacrificing love. You keep holding up Jesus is on the way. And we may feel the effects of COVID and we may uh, struggle with all of this anarchy and all of that and, and, and well, we should be troubled. But I want to tell you, you remind yourself, I am a person who belongs to God according to the kind intention. James tells us that. The kind intentions of the will of God. Who are we? We're the elect. And it's a beautiful thing.